Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Welcome to this edition of the business side of music. I'm your host, Bob Bender. And today in the studio, we have Aaron Benward. Um, I've known Aaron for a few years now. Actually, our history goes way back uh, uh, to the record label days, but uh, we reconnected a couple years ago. Uh, he uh, originally started out uh, uh, as a son-father duo with a group called Aaron Jeffrey. Uh, they had great success on the uh, CCM Christian music scene. They garnered 10 number one Billboard singles and sold over a million copies uh, on all three of their albums combined. Uh, Aaron was able to release his debut album titled Imagine that had a Billboard number one single called Captured in 2000. Uh, he then founded the country music duo Blue County with his friend uh, Scott Reeves. Blue County recorded one album for Curb Records, which is my uh, old alma mater, which included the top 10 single Good Little Girls and the top 20 hit That's Cool, which Aaron co-wrote. Blue County was also nominated three times for the CMA ACM Duo of the Year. 2009, Aaron created a live show in Las Vegas called Nashville Unplugged, the story behind the song. Uh, that features the hit songwriters from all genres in a back porch songwriter in the round style show. We're going to talk about that in a little bit here with him. Uh, Nashville Unplugged is actually seven years running and currently plays every Friday night in Las Vegas. Uh, he's had numerous songs placed on shows like ABC's hit Nashville and Bravo's Project Runway. Aaron co-wrote and co-produced the theme song and the end title for Walt Disney's Monkey Kingdom. We'll have to get into that <laughs> one uh, called It's Our World. Uh, he's also co-written seven songs that have been recorded by some of the biggest recording uh, uh, artists in uh, J-pop and K-pop, as we like to call it these days. Recently, Aaron took his talents to the silver screen by starring in two films called The Act of God and The Song. Uh, in, uh, I guess in The Act of God, he plays uh, David King, who is an iconic outlaw country artist, kind of the a la Waylon Jennings style. We'll have to hear more about that. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Man, that's a whole bunch of hot air. That means a whole <laughs> bunch of nothing, but thank you. <laughs> that makes you sound really important. <laughs> well, you're, whoever your publicist is wrote a good bio, <laughs> so, so we're real happy. So one of the reasons we wanted to get you on the show was to talk about, uh, you know, I guess your claim to fame or a lot of it is is, is in songwriting. You, you've had a lot of great success in songwriting. Uh, but being a songwriter today, it ain't what it used to be. It's it's really changed the dynamics of, especially the record business, because we're not selling CDs anymore. We're not selling downloads. So, tell me a little bit about what it is that the struggles that you're seeing as a songwriter these days. Yeah, I think it's we need to go back to you know the genesis of me becoming a songwriter. I was, um, you know, I, my dad and I, you mentioned, were a duo, and uh, I started writing songs for that, and you know, became kind of in community with and around some of the great songwriters and began to learn that craft. Um, I wasn't the kid that sat on his bed from 12 years old and wrote poetry and every single day. I was very much an athlete and very involved in you know, you know musical theater and things. Because you actually went to Belmont University on, on, a, on a soccer scholarship, right? Yeah, I did, yeah, actually. Okay. Yeah, I went yeah. to college to play soccer. Um, and uh, so I, it was a scenario for me where I, I looked at it as, one, I wanted to have a voice in my, my artistry when, when I became an artist and decided to sing with my father. Um, and then, you know, I moved into my own solo career, which then I for sure wanted my songs to be mine. And, <clears throat> you know, all of that kind of came together, and, and um, I started signing different publishing deals over the course of my career, which basically means that, you know, there's publishers that will give you certain amounts of money to basically write songs that they will either 100, 100% own that intellectual property, each song, or they will co-publish that with you and you will be partners in the ownership of that. So that's when I began to learn kind of the more the business side of publishing uh, because I needed to as a songwriter and to be, you know, a, a wise kind of father and husband. Well, so, so let me ask you there, uh, a, a publishing deal, because that's obviously 
what songwriters aspire to get as, as a publishing deal. Mm-hmm. Was it a difficult process? Was it an easy process for you when you first went there? At first, because I was a signed recording artist to a major record company, um, publishers see that as an easier <laughs> scenario for, for uh, signing someone to a publishing deal. Right. So at first it wasn't difficult. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a nice way to, they give you basically a, a sum of money, a salary, if you will, that is recoupable. On all, on all your, you know, because <laughs> everything in the record. because everything this is, is just, recoupable. Everything is just a loan, basically. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but at least it h- helps to alleviate some of the financial stress while you're pursuing your dream. Um, and you know, but now this day and age, um, as just someone who no longer is signed to a major record company, uh, it's inc- incredibly difficult to to get a publishing deal. Therefore. I've actually had to come up with different means of income to be able to allow myself to continue to write songs. We we almost do have to reinvent the wheel now in the music business because, uh, you know, uh, I'll be saying this a lot on, on the podcast, but, you know, 15 years ago we were selling CDs and five years ago we were selling downloads and now it's all streaming. That's right. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, Television and film is starting to feel the same effect because of the new platforms of how we communicate and get music out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go a little bit into how how has that affected a songwriter these days? You know, we because you're not selling CDs, you're not selling downloads. That that revenue stream has diminished greatly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, what other what other options or opportunities do you look at? Well. I think it's it's important for the listener to kind of understand in the most elementary level the the revenue stream that used to happen what we call mechanical royalties and that was, those are the royalties that are generated by the sale of at the time a CD or before that a cassette or an eight track or right. a phonograph or record. vinyl <laughs> yeah. even, and now is uh, really just uh, out there in a digital space and easily uh, shared by for free right. so right. that alone you can go ahead and begin to to think wow it's a, it's a whole different ball game for those people that provided for uh, their families by writing songs. So um, let's go back to the when, when record sales were cranking and you were at the record company, so you know this. Um, as, a, as a career songwriter, by the way, since uh, the year 2000, 90% of all the career songwriters in Nashville that were doing it for a living are no longer there. Wow. 90%. Wow. So take any you know, job, uh, a job you know, kind of industry, if you will, I should say, and take 90% of the workforce away and then start looking at the product. That's near extinction. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, but it, but back in the heyday, going back to your initial analogy of, of the record sales and mechanical roads, just to kind of bring it full circle, um, if I was able to write a song and get it on a Garth Brooks record, and it wasn't a single, wasn't a hit, never on the radio, never heard it before, unless he sang it live in concert. It was just an album just cut. Just an album cut. Right. And I wrote that completely by myself. Um, uh, every time that song was basically purchased on an album, the album was purchased, I was going to receive just under 10 cents, 9 cents, let's say, right. per copy. You know, and you know how many copies you sold. Yeah. Multiply that times 9 cents, and that's not a bad living for a guy. Right. You could go out and buy a nice car, maybe even a nice house. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Now, um, obviously, hard copy records are no longer so sold. Therefore, that, that stream is gone. The download at 99 cents is pick and choose so if you have even if you have a song on, on the garth brooks album they're not going to probably pick unless it, it's the hit unless it's the hit right um so that therefore that's gone and then then now music is consumed m- more than ever before at a higher rate than ever before which is a great thing it's just that the songwriter has been left to figure out how to be paid because um when the deal was struck in 2000 with the streaming companies and the three major record labels that still own probably over 85 to 88 percent of all the master recordings uh there was really no, take nothing taken into account of the songwriters and the publishers the people that actually create the music so therefore today when you hear one of my songs or any songwriter for that matter on pandora or spotify or apple music roughly they're getting ten seven ten thousandth of a one penny yeah every time it's heard so uh, and and how many does that take to to even buy dinner, you know, it, it's... Well, I can tell you this. A good friend of mine just recently, uh, he had the most played song in country radio in 2009 called She's Country. And he wrote it with a friend of his, so it's a co- co-written song of her, for Jason Aldean. And he got a statement from BMI uh, not this past this past quarter, and I believe had over 40 million spins or, or close to it, and his check was for $200. Oh, 
Wow. You know, roughly. Yeah. That's an estimated figure. But so you know, he can't he can't he can't buy groceries because he's got kids. Right. <laughs> so right. we're talking uh, that's that's, yeah. ha- that's half a week of groceries. Yeah. So let's let's progress forward a little bit when we talk about uh, your friend who wrote She's Country for Jason Aldean. You've actually got a, a group of friends that you have toured with. Uh, we had the opportunity to see this uh, show uh, a few months ago, and you call yourself, uh, you, the, the four of you, I guess it is, you call yourselves the Ghost Town Troubadours. Yeah, man. So uh, in light of kind of us looking at our futures um, as songwriters, career songwriters, um, myself and Danny Myrick, who I just mentioned uh, with the song with Jason Aldean and many other songs he's written, uh, Travis Howard, who's a, a great songwriter, wrote many hits for Miranda Lambert and actually was on Nashville Star with her when she was discovered. And then lastly, Reggie Ham, who is a two-time CSAC Songwriter of the Year. And gosh, he's, he had the um, Beijing Olympic Games theme and he wrote the, the song for the win- one of the winners of American Idol. So guys that know what they're doing. Right. Um, we got together and started talking about what we're, how we were going to make it. And um, the close friends of mine and all of a sudden we go, you know what? Maybe we should take this into our own hands and at least fight. Because um, we are definitely fighting big business. We're fighting the Googles of the world that, that don't want to pay us for some reason, to be honest with you. Um, and so we said, well, we came up with this idea of what does America, what does the, what does the middle American think about songwriting? Do they understand it? Do they even get how we're paid? Do they have a concept of maybe, well, just because they have a song, they must hang out and rub elbows with all the famous people, so they must be rich. And right, right. Anyway, we got on the road. We started in Nashville. We launched this tour where every single day we would go to the next city and eat. Hopefully that show would pay for us to get to the next city. Right. All the while documenting it, uh, we, we brought out uh, an Emmy-nominated director, uh, Sean Silva, uh, from, from ESPN 30 for 30s, as well as all the... Kenny Chesney videos and Jason Aldean videos he directs, and, and he's got a couple of shows on TV now. He's fantastic. He came out, gave us all of his time, and his resources as far as his cameras and such, and we began to get out there and ask Middle America their thoughts and quickly, quickly discovered what we thought we would. And that is most people think that, you know, the revenue generated by a song, half of that is given to the songwriter. And when we began to educate them, they, they honestly got some very, a lot of people got angry. Um, and like they looked at this and how you guys are the ones that write it you, they wouldn't be a song without you guys and so that then began to move into this whole new new thing now that we're doing and in, 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 in kind of the second phase of production on this documentary called The Ghost Town Troubadours and the Assassination of the American Songwriter uh, because if we don't do something it will be gone and you know I don't know if this documentary can, can change it quick, that quickly um, for me and for my generation, but hopefully for the generation to come, because right now I get kids a lot of times, I say kid, 20 year old, half my age, come up to me and ask me about how to get into songwriting, how to do it for a living. And, I, and it's hard for me to look them in the eye and go, you have a real shot. Because at this point, unless they're recording artists and they build their own career through YouTube and do some things on their own, and hopefully uh, it takes hold, they don't. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, this is Bob Bender, president of Bob Bender Productions. Since 1987, our company has provided consultation and artist direction services for recording industry artists. If you're looking to take your music career to the next level, or simply need advice on jumpstarting a project or marketing one that's been completed, then we're here to assist you with over 40 years of experience in the entertainment business. We offer individual or group sessions, in person, or over the phone or Skype consultations. Feel free to call our office at 661-326-1140 or email us at info at bobbenderproductions.com for more details. You're listening to the business side of music. So we're here today with uh, Aaron Benward and uh, catching up on uh, the songwriters of the world and, and uh, the challenges, I guess, or <laughs> the obstacles that they have uh, these days. Uh, I, I know that when I was at the record label years ago, um, 
and downloads started to come out, we were actually up against uh, the, the, the pirating of it, you know, the, mm-hmm. the Napsters and the Morpheus and Kazaa. And I remember talking to my neighbor across the road who was a general manager of a Kroger grocery store. And uh, we were talking about downloads. And he said, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. Hmm. And I said to him, well, what if I went into your grocery store and, and grabbed a shopping cart and started going up and down the aisles and, you know, well, I want this and I want that. And, oh, yeah, by the way, my buddy Aaron wants, you know, this steak and exactly. you know, my kids want, you know, these hot dogs. And I walk out of the store without paying. And he goes, well, that's shoplifting. And I said, well, it's basically the same principle, what you're doing. Exactly. Now. And and so what I found out was it, 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 it was a bit of an education process that you had to give to the consumer because most people back in those days didn't actually realize or, or, or failed to accept the fact that they were breaking the law. Uh, because, you know, when I was a kid growing up in high school, we'd go out and buy our record and then we'd burn it to cassette and, you know, we'd burn copies of that cassettes and give it to all of our mm-hmm. other friends and we didn't know any difference. And and now the platform that provides that music, uh, which is uh, basically an MP3 file, is so much easier to obtain with very little work. You just hit a button or two and, you know, you've got the music. Yeah, you know, I, I, back then, talk, speaking of your days at the record label, when all of this came out and file sharing happened and after this and after that, I, I don't know about you, you probably speak to it because you were an executive at the time. What I saw as an artist was the record business, the business side of music, <laughs> didn't do anything about it. They kind of said, oh, we're big enough, we're gonna, we'll get through it, and kind of said, ah, oh, there's no way they can put a dent in what we do. When, when it happened to Hollywood, Hollywood shut it down within three days. Right, right. And... You know, bottom line is, to your point, is, is, it, is it shoplifting? 100%. Because you got to understand that a guy and a, and a, a guy, two guys, and a guy and a girl, or two, or two girls, whoever the song or the, the song, the actual craftsman of this song, have had heartbreaks. They've had, you know, penniless days and nights. They've had laid up at night wondering how they're going to do it. They've had death. They've had triumph. All these things that we all have, but then they have the ability of taking these things, the lives they've, the lives they've led, um, the, the things they've gone to, put it into three and a half minutes that then affects you to go and listen to it more or share it with somebody say, so you got to hear this song or use it at your wedding or put it or at your, or say, I want this song at my funeral. Right. Yeah. How, how is that? How does that have no value to where someone can go? Well, I just take that. I don't understand that. So. You know, the consumer is not doing the wrong thing, I don't think, from the standpoint on streaming level, because there's been a delivery system invented that allows them to listen to for free. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right? It's You're not their fault. right, yeah. Uh, wh- what it comes down to is the problem is the, d- the delivery system has become more valuable than the actual thing they're delivering, and that's a problem. Yeah. And, and I think that's... Th- you brought up something that's actually interesting because when it, when I was at the record label, uh, when when this file sharing started to happen, we all looked at. I remember going to some distribution meetings, and there's Warner Brothers, and there's Atlantic Records, and there's Asylum, and there's Curb, and and there's all these labels, and we're all talking, and everybody to the note was going, "Oh, this is not going to affect us." <laughs> And, and then, you know, six months later, we, we all meet again, and we're like, well, we're starting to see a little dip in sales, but we're not real concerned. And within six months after that, we're all going, holy crap, we're mm-hmm. in trouble. And at that point, we, we estimated as an industry, so every single record label worldwide, we were losing about $100 million a year in, in pirated bootleg you know, file sharing. Uh, that was just the tip of the iceberg. And you brought up another valid point because – Hollywood, yeah, they exactly did the right thing when they released DVDs and they digitally encoded them so you, right. couldn't, you couldn't copy them. Mm-hmm. And we had the ability in the music business to do it. Uh, you know, that's an answer I hope to get out of someone someday. Why as an industry we didn't do it? But we almost created our own Pandora's box and opened it up and allowed this to take place. So it's, it's been something uh, that's never going to change. I, I was talking to some folks at a conference a few weeks ago about the music business and 
we all concur that the music business will never be what it was 10, 15 years ago. It's just not going to be. It's going to almost have to reinvent itself. Uh, so getting back to Ghost Town Troubadours, you guys traveled across the country. Uh, uh, I guess you were like in a van. and yeah, we <laughs> Everybody was file sharing the driving, oh, yeah. I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 How was that experience? It was amazing just yeah. to, uh, one, to get out there and kind of rub elbows with this m people. I mean, we would talk to... I'm, you know, some people, we went from, I don't know if we're in Lubbock, Texas, talking to a dairy farmer and just really trying to equate our product with his. He has the ability, whenever he milks his cows every single day, to put a value on his milk. Right. To then sell, to store, like your, your Kroger guy, yeah. right? And so this is how much it costs. And if you want my milk, you're going to pay me this. The, <laughs> the songwriter doesn't. Yeah. We have never one time been able to put a value on our music and our songs. I think the one thing that that may change in that, uh, or, or maybe change isn't the correct word, but the control dynamic of, of that for the songwriters, you now, without the aid or the assistance of a record label, because the songwriter, if you're writing great songs, you don't need that record deal. You have the ability to get it out there into a populace depending on what platform that is, is you know, whether it's content, uh, physical content, or, or it's digital access, to be able to build a fan base and get them uh, introduced, getting, getting a mass population introduced to, to your music that you may have not had that opportunity before. I know as a kid growing up, when I would uh, read the, the album credits, I would like to see who, I'd, I'd look at the session players, who's the guy who played bass or guitar or drums, mm -hmm. but I also look at the songwriters because mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as a 13-year-old kid, that intrigued me in, on who was actually writing the songs. And you saw the same name time and time and time mm. and time again, you know, whether it was, it was Carol King or, mm -hmm. or whoever it was. And, and uh, you know, so, but what has to happen now is you as the songwriters, you guys have to figure out how to translate that into a revenue stream. And I think one of the, the, the things I think is so cool that you've done is you've created this documentary on, uh, on, on the Ghost Town Troubadours. And uh, where, do you, where are you going to go with that? What, what do you plan on doing with that? So we're in this phase now where we uh, we're actually, next week uh, I'll, we fly to New York and we're um, meeting with some, some investors to kind of help us finish it. Um, this first phase, this whole tour across the country that we shot was all you know bootstrapped, if you will. We were able to fund it by those gigs that we did. Um, and then, um, so the next phase is to be, at, we went, we are, we're going to New York to interview uh, record execs, um, attorneys that have been a part of, you know, the Department of Justice and the songwriter plight. Yeah. And, and, who, and on our side. Good word. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, we're also getting now, Jason Aldean just did an interview for us. Um, we have some other, looks like pretty, pretty big recording artists, especially those who don't really write songs and need, wouldn't have a career without a songwriter. It shares their perspective, and so we're kind of assimilating all this information. Uh, we're get, gonna hit, get the uh, hopefully some congressmen who have been helping us in, in D.C. and 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 sharing our stories. Um, so we're putting it all together, and then we will, you know, we'll, you know, gosh, if HBO would be would show it, that would be one of our top, you know, priorities to get it on. If not, we'll go to some f film festivals, Netflix, things like that, and just really the heart behind it, man. To be honest with you, is just to to really change public opinion on what we do because we're such a small, since 2000 especially, diminished quite a bit. We're such a small group of people, of creatives, but yet um, we have such a loud voice, but nobody knows it's us. Right. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vinny Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag.com. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey.
We're here with Aaron Benward talking about the songwriters and, and what they're going through these days. You brought up something a little bit uh, ago in regards to the artist versus the songwriter. What a lot of people don't realize, I think, at least the, the layman that's out there that's buying music, the non-musician, let's say, is they don't realize that the artist doesn't write most of the music, that it is the songwriter that's out there that's that's pitching that. To, so you're in music row, you're, you're, you're on the doors knocking or you're, you're networking or interfacing with people. Your, your goal is to get this music in front of the artists to get them to mm -hmm. perform it. Uh, is that becoming more competitive than it used to, or because the, the ranks have thinned out, is it a little easier or how, how is that process these days? It's more competitive than it's ever been. I think, um, you know, you have those great writers, artist writers, I call them Taylor Swift of the world, or Ed Sheeran, those are, they write the all their own. John Mayer. I mean, those those guys are great artists um, and writers themselves. But you also, you know, these artists that were assigned to be a, a voice and a face and a brand now want to sit in a room and with the people that don't care to be that and have been the ones that have been pinning the songs. You know, and I can't blame them. You know, I can't blame the artists for it. They want to be a part of the. The, the creation of the music that they're going to be singing. Um, but a lot, oftentimes they don't have much, they don't give much to the creative process. Right. Um, so they're just kind of hanging out in the room with you. But the reason why it's harder than it's ever been is you, the, this, this new group of artists specific to Nashville are people I don't know. And, you know, I, it's not like I'm going there, I'm there all the time and rubbing elbows and going, Hey man, right with me. And it's this whole different game. It's, it, there's, there's a new class coming in and it should, Yeah. you know, so, um, you know, I've, I've steered my, my focus uh, less from trying to get on artists' records because unless I have a single, it's not going to pay me anyway, to TV and film and, and really writing for, for that, which I'm loving. Um, and then and also there's a show on Netflix called The Ranch, which is Ashton Kutcher's show that he right. stars in, yeah. and Sam Elliott and Deborah Messing. And, and I performed on that. as a, They had me come on a play and... Um, just got to be able to come become friends with the show creator, and they use, gosh, seven to nine uh, cues of music every every episode, and it's all country music. And, and you make money off. And that. they make money off. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. So I've really been focused on things like that. And then, as you mentioned earlier, and uh, believe it or not, I don't know how it happened, but a year and a half ago, just kind of got introduced to Korea and J Japan and many many artists over there and began writing songs in English for them and then they translate so yeah and and that's something that we're discovering especially with but with country music or but really more so with Americana music and what maybe some people don't realize is Americana is one of the strongest growing genres of music out there mm -hmm. but especially in Europe you get over into the United Kingdom get over into England or Ireland or Scotland or or even into uh, Germany mm -hmm. and, and Austria and they love American music they love that Americana sound and whether that's you know whether that's a Marty Stewart or it's a John Cougar Mellencamp or or um, you know North Carolina chocolate drops it doesn't matter they just love the music and so th there's there's a whole new world out there uh, that you know as songwriters y you can branch into and I think that uh, you know television is a great exposure for that because um, radio is changing you know we don't mm -hmm. we don't have the strong uh, terrestrial radio that we used to have it's it's all becoming very either satellite driven or internet driven now uh and what terrestrials out there is is corporate um but television like you said the ranch on netflix which is a great show mm -hmm. you know my wife and i watched the first season in probably a few days and absolutely loved <laughs> it uh you know that's become the new platform i guess to get your music out there either in television or film or even video games mm -hmm. you know if you can find that that keyhole to get your music into it, uh, it it's it's a great opportunity and shouldn't be overlooked. Absolutely, I mean, you know, we've been talking about the, the you know the sky's falling type of scenario for songwriters, but you know, I, I also want to. I'm not that guy at heart. I'm a positive cat, so you know, it, 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 this day and age, it's, you can, you can find any type of music you want. You can consume it as much as you want. And for young writers and artists that are out there, I would very highly encourage them to. Stay very, very active on social media and just 
think creatively outside the box of how to bring in more fans uh, uh, and do it con on a consistent basis because the more content you have and people keep coming back to your site, your channel, your whatever that you, ha you choose will cause them to stay intrigued and stay, and stay connected with you. And um, Taylor Swift's a prime exa example. I mean, she's the biggest artist in the world now, and she yeah. started by doing that. Let's talk about Nashville Unplugged for a minute. Uh, you, every Friday night in Las Vegas? Actually, Saturday now. Oh, Maybe Saturday Saturdays. night, okay. Yes, Saturday but it was Friday Vegas. for like six, seven years. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, Nashville Unplugged is, is a show that um, when I got out of my, my last record deal, um, a buddy and I were out here, in, I say out here, in Vegas, um, <clears throat> doing a, a benefit for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. It was a songwriter in the round, and we were just kind of, it's all acoustic, telling the stories behind our songs, and Oh, and uh, so I was talking to someone that uh, was an entertainment buyer about that concept. Long story short, we started the show once a month, and um, every every weekend now, um, bring out different writers from Nashville mostly, some from LA, um, to sit on basically sit on stools with their guitars and uh, storytellers, like very much like VH1, you know, uh, storyteller, MTV Unplugged kind of vibe. And you get to hear the stories behind these songs that you know and love, a lot of them. Um, and um, it's really cool. It's very in improv, very interact interactive. We sing on each other's songs, harmonies, and play on each other's stuff and, you know, goof off with the crowd. A lot of times we'll write a song, you know, in the middle, in front of the crowd, on the spot. And it's really kind of a cool show. It's at Mandalay Bay every single Saturday night at 8 p.m. And it's called Nashville Unplugged. And there's a there's a fan page on Facebook that you can go and kind of get more information. And typically, how many songwriters do you have on there with you? You're hosting it. Mm -hmm. Two to three. Yeah. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah. Um, it's a two hour show. And there's uh, a lot of bantering going back and forth <laughs> along with. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, you, these songwriters, but I mean, some of the most one most intelligent people on the planet is from the standpoint, of obviously, with the way they can craft words. But they are incredibly, incredibly comedic and quick and. Really, really funny. No show's ever the same because, you know, I bring different people every every week. So you never know what you're going to get. So it's a lot of fun. So if you're in Las Vegas on a Saturday, you should definitely go to the Mandalay Bay. Mandalay Bay at check out the It's show a free show. You, yeah. you can't lose, hey, man. No, you can't lose. I'll give you your money back if you don't like it. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Walt Disney's monkey kingdom <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> i mean let's face it you're not a 20 year old kid <laughs> but uh, i want to hear this story yeah i mean you know like like we do i mentioned i'm focusing more on tv and film and trying to get songs in there i mean it was i was with a couple co-writer friends of mine who uh had gotten word that uh, disney was looking for the end title for you know they do these nature the big earth movies that they do every year right and this one was about this the monkey uh, monkeys in the monkey kingdom and, and uh they kind of they, what when a lot of times when uh, certain TV shows or films or commercials or whatever are looking for songs, they'll send out a specific, pretty specific kind of breakdown of what they're looking for. Stylistically, um, sonically, uh, lyrically, often they'll even maybe give some phrases that they like to have in the song. Um, and so you're really r writing to a target. It gets into that much minutia. Yes. Oh, yes. my gosh. Especially ad campaigns for commercials. And, and, and we're talking about people who don't know <laughs> uh, anything about music. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so this was one of those scenarios. Uh, and I actually like it. It's uh, a little bit different than just getting in a room and writing a song for the sake of writing a song. You're getting in a room and you actually have a target. And it's almost like you're throwing darts at this target trying to get exactly what they're looking for. Right. Hit that bullseye. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, we wrote this this thing and um, and uh, try to kind of picture. We didn't have the, the the luxury of seeing the movie, so we were trying to picture what the movie would be like because we'd seen some of them, put ourselves in those trees with the monkeys, and uh, came up with a song. <laughs> and the winner of The Voice, uh, Jackie Lee, she she sang it. And uh, when we went to the movie theater, it was pretty cool to uh, to sit there and hear your song at the end. Right. You you get you gave birth to something. Absolutely. And and now it's on the big screen. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you cool. don't get sick of that ever. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, appreciate having you on the show today. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'd love to have you back sometime. Uh, good luck, please, on uh, on the Ghost Town Troubadours. And and the working title of that is the working title is called the Ghost Town Troubadours and the Assassination of the American Songwriter. That and, uh, right there hmm. is so profound. You can follow us on uh, we have Instagram at Ghost Town Troubadours. Uh, Troubadours, if you know how to spell it, it's T-R-O-U-B-A-D-O-U-R-S, yeah. um, as well as Facebook. And we, we're kind of, as we go, we're, we're, we're posting, you know, the progress of the film, and then uh, hopefully we'll come back and be able to tell people about it. I, I think if you're a songwriter out there, if you're a musician out there, if you're an aspiring artist, definitely follow 
uh, these guys, Ghost Town Troubadours, uh, and of course Aaron Benoit, and, and follow what's going to happen with this documentary because it, 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 I've seen a little bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you sent me the sizzle roll for me to take a look at, and just that little bit is such an eye opener. And, and uh, I, man, best of luck on getting that man. out there. Thanks right. so much, Bob. Thanks for being a part of the show. Thank you. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender for Bob Bender Productions. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rebus. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.